Hello, Minnesota. Welcome back to the Tony Hernandez Show after I took a week off. I'm your host, Tony Hernandez, and today is Saturday, November 23rd. We got a great show. We're going to be bringing on a U.S. Senate candidate, uh, County Commissioner Chris Dahlberg. Uh, but before we do, uh, we're going to uh, relay some information. So, Dallas, if you can uh, put up on the screen, uh, the fourth congressional uh, Republicans are doing a holiday charity drive, and it's from November 25th through December 7th. And you can donate gently worn or new winter outerwear. You could donate uh, children's toys or a whole bunch of other things to help uh, those in need in the fourth congressional district. And uh, this is being hosted by the Congressional District 4 Republicans. And you can see it says, watch for Santa in his big, big red sleigh when he picks up donated clothing and toys at participating drop locations below on December 7th. And it looks like you can uh, drop off uh, these items, uh, whether it's jackets or children's toys, at the Mermaid in Moundsview or the VFW in Roseville over on Woodhill Drive. And uh, the other location is, uh, is at Meister's at 1056 Highway 96 West. So a uh, very good thing that the 4th Congressional Republicans are doing, the Holiday Charity Drive, helping out those in uh, need. And again, it's November 25th to December 7th, and you can drop off those items at the locations below. And so with that, we are going to bring on our first guest. Uh, we're really honored to have the U.S. Senate candidate, Chris Dahlberg, here. Chris, welcome hey, uh, well, to the thanks. show. It's good to be on the show. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, it's your first time being on here. We it certainly uh, appreciate yeah. you having uh, you being here. And uh, can you just talk a little more about uh, your background? Now, you were elected into uh, St. Louis County uh, Commissioner in 2008. Is that right? Uh, correct. Yeah. So I had actually been a Duluth City Councilor many years ago. Oh. Uh, when I was 28 years old, I got elected back in 1991. Took, some, took a break off, and actually I went back to law school late in life. So I got my law degree at 41 years old and uh, had always been interested in public policy. I ended up doing a tour to Iraq, and when I came back wow. from Iraq, I decided you know, I, I was looking at getting in, back and interested. I was watching the county government and thinking, you know, we could do better. I just felt they were sort of, at that time, out of control. They needed to, to stable the, uh, the ship as it would. And so I took on a 32-year incumbent. Nice guy, just didn't want to go at the time. And I said, you know, it's time, I think, to have uh, fresh leadership. And I ran and was able to win and then uh, ran again for re-election just in 2012. Hmm, that's yeah. uh, pretty amazing. Yeah. And, and I guess Veterans Day wasn't too long ago. So right. thank you uh, for your service in Iraq. And you said you served one tour there. Can you talk a little more about what you were oh, doing there? Yeah, sure. I actually uh, served 2004, 2005. So I was in civil affairs. And then my job when I got into Iraq was the economic development of Baghdad. And so I was a captain. And that's, you know, over there, I, I was working out of the embassy and I had generals walking around. So you're kind of on the low rank of the totem pole. And then they told you, what is your job? Well, they said the whole economic development of Baghdad. Well, that's pretty unrealistic for a captain. And one of the things we did is kind of hit the what's called the low-hanging fruit. So we tried to make as much impact as we could to stabilize the country because we knew if it was stabilized, you had less young, angry men that were being recruited into terrorism, and uh, this would try to stabilize the country. So it was a it was a hard effort, and you know we were going into a country that was basically a socialist country, and uh, um, and and so you always have your work cut out to try to uh, you know put in some of the principles of a free market system and get things back off the ground. Mm -hmm. And I should say, the, first of all, congratulations. There was a recent uh, was it Survey USA oh, yeah. poll, uh, public policy that uh, found that you were actually ranked by Minnesota voters as the number one person yeah. to contend against uh, Senator Al Franken. And, uh, you, you know, are, is your name well known throughout Minnesota? Like, how did you become the, the, the well, number one in the poll? You know, I think that was really encouraging for us because actually the other three major candidates had been in since the summer. And we didn't enter until uh, September 26th. I kind of waited until my retirement point. And, and got in at that point. And one of the things, though, we've been doing is sort of boots on the ground. So the other candidates, uh, you know, I think maybe they've been going out to Washington, D.C. or trying to get the big money and the lure of it. And we were doing these meet and greets where there might be 10 or 15 people. We were down in Mankato, Rochester. Uh, last weekend, we were at Alexandria, Fergus Falls, Moorhead, East mm. Grand Forks. I had ma a mass on Sunday morning, got up, did another meet and greet. But when you go into these towns, 
the word of mouth starts to spread. And I think one of the ha things that the poll picked up, I'm already well known in northeastern Minnesota, but I know I'm not well known in the metro and the other uh, parts of greater Minnesota. And so I'm working hard. And you're going to find no other candidate that's going to work harder. But we found so early, uh, one month after it, that people were already starting to pick up on this. Mm -hmm. And you were elected in 2008 in St. Louis County. Right. It's not exactly a, a Republican stronghold there. No. And you were able to defeat an incumbent of 32 years with the DFL endorsement. And you ran. So what is your uh, secret or, or how are you winning <laughs> these uh, Democratic-leaning uh, voters in, in your area? Well, you know, I think you just uh, talk to their heart. And I, I think that the problem we've had is, um, I think I'm running as a Republican, and the issue is the Republican Party's had a problem with, they've got absolutely the right message, but they put forward the wrong messengers. And I think they've put forward people that just can't relate to the average person. And, you know, I think Mitt Romney was a good case. I, I, I would compare almost Obama and Frank in, in the similar position. I think they were both, in a sense, weak incumbents and would have a chance of vulnerability. And yet, uh, with Romney, what we did, and, and, and it's, an, it's too easy of a target for them. Nice guy, but it was a case where they could easily target him and say, oh, here comes, you know, a rich millionaire elitist. And, and where he might have been in, in touch, it was just too much of a target. And you have to have a person that can reach the average person. Up in uh, northeastern Minnesota, I've been able to get uh, the, the blue collar, you know, the Reagan Democrats, as they talk about. And these guys are, and gals are, are, are common sense, conservative individuals. They believe that we should run our government just the way that we run our own home finances. And wouldn't that be a novelty if Washington, D.C. was doing that? <laughs> We'd be in a little better shape. Mm. And uh, so a little more about, uh, yeah. about that area. And, you know, if you get, if you don't get the endorsement, the Republican endorsement, I, there's a lot of talk in, in the governor's race, especially a lot of those candidates have said, well, if I don't get the endorsement, I'm, I'm running to the primary. Right. And so it's almost guaranteed that for the governor's race, there's going to be multiple Republicans running in the primary. Has your campaign or have you decided that if you don't get the endorsement, are you going to run in the primary, seeing that you're number one in the polls right now? Right. We haven't made that decision right now. And here's the reason is I would like everybody to abide by the party endorsement. And I've been involved behind the scenes in grassroots uh, party politics since I was 16 years old. And I'm 51 now and I've been to some of those late night conventions where I've been to the 14th or 15th ballot so I respect that process but it's a little difficult and it seems unfair for our campaign to say okay the Dahlberg campaign needs to be committed to only go to the prime to the endorsement and everybody else has said at this point you know I'd like the endorsement but by the way I'm running for the primary so it, it seems to me it puts us as if we we're uh, in a fight with our one arm tied behind our back I'm going to encourage the other candidates to try to say hey Let's all abide by the endorsement. I don't know if I'll be successful. Mm -hmm. And the other candidates being uh, State Senator Julianne Ortman. Uh, there's a, a gentleman by the name of Mike McFadden who, who's running. Are there, is there anyone else in the... In, in uh, the Abler room? from up in Anoka. And, there, and there's, yeah, there's several other candidates. And so, uh, you know, what the indications I've heard is they've all talked about uh, that they're going for the primary all the way down the road. So... Uh, you know, it's uh, you know it makes it difficult, but I think you got to look at at the long haul. And one of the things I have is I have supporters saying to me, uh, Chris, you know, it's you can't just go to the endorsement if everybody else is going to go to the primary. And mm -hmm. they've been working along with at this point. And I've already had volunteers in there that are putting time up in the headquarters, and they're going out in the field. So for them to you know to be in the position of saying our campaign is the only campaign that says this is it at this point, mm -hmm. that's, it kind of puts us in a tough and mm -hmm. tough position. Well, well, we'll we'll get into a little sure. more about the the state of the the party yeah. and, and conservatism in, okay. in Minnesota. Uh, but before that, I, I just want everyone to get to know you a little more because you have quite an okay. expansive okay. Uh, resume. Okay. You did uh, share some pictures with sure. Dallas, so we're going to uh, right. flip through some of those. But so you're a uh, county commissioner. You, you said you're past city council. Right. Uh, you're a veteran, uh, served in our, in, in our military, and any, anything else? We got some pictures here that sure. uh, we're okay. going to show. Okay, so. well, and then, you know, the, my, my proudest thing is I'm a parent of uh, a nine-year-old uh, uh, wonderful energetic daughter, uh, Maya Olin Dahlberg, and that's kind of my motivation for running because of this $17 trillion debt. I mean, we're saddling her generation and the kids into that. And, uh, and here's a picture here you got up there, front porch leadership. And that's my theme, uh, Tony. Front porch leadership. Front porch leadership. And the whole idea is I want people in Minnesota to feel as if they could sit on a front porch with their United States Senator and talk to them. And, you know, Lincoln talked about this being government uh, of the people, by the people, for the people. 
And right now, I would argue that what it's turned into is a government of special interests, you know, of, by, and for special interests in Washington, D.C. And so the people that are at the table, and it's both sides, Republicans and Democrats, it tends to be it's millionaires. It's a millionaires club with the uh, U.S. Senate, and they're not representative of the average person. So I would like to return this today back to the point where I am everybody. I'm running as a Republican, but I want to be Demo the Democratic U.S. Senator, the Republican U.S. Senator, Independent U.S. Senator, and I want them to feel that I'm a common sense person that they can talk to, and I think we've lost that. And I'm also talking about returning government. Now, yeah, here's, here's we're at the Zoo Fest with my daughter, Maya, and you can see the big pumpkin up there. And so, you know, that's one of the things, though. These are things where... Two pumpkins, right, the daughter right. and the pumpkin. And, Tony, you know, you, you talked to me about earlier, how, does, how do we reach out and how do you win as mm -hmm. a candidate? And I think right there is the picture. It's the issue is, is that we all, you know, sometimes we get too cerebral, and we all have, it's about the heart. And it's all about our family. We have dreams. Maybe we want our kid to do this. But more and more we're realizing government's saying, you know, we've got an idea what your family should be like or what your family should do. And I think that for her, and, and when I was growing up, it was, it was unlimited. You know, what I wanted to do, what I wanted to go off and do, the government wasn't going to control it. And I think more and more we're having that problem. And also what we're doing is saddling their future. So, you know, that's, uh, that's the thing. It's, it's all about community. And, um, you know, that's, that's the big part of my message. And, you know, I talk about front porch leadership. I've actually been out uh, door knocking in Minneapolis and out in New Richfield. And, uh, and I think that, so, uh, you know, I've been to some of these homes and they said, I've never heard of a U.S. senator uh, going door knocking. And that's what you're going to find. I'm not going to knock on 5 million doors. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not naive. But wouldn't, isn't it nice that the first thing a U.S. Senate candidate does is he actually goes off in the neighborhoods rather than going to Washington, D.C. to see how much special interest money he can get? That is. Yeah. And what are, you, uh, what are you hearing when you're on people's front porches and, and doorsteps? What are people telling Chris Dahlberg? What's wrong with our country? Well, you know, or, I, or what do they want you to do in Washington, D.C.? Well, I think, obviously, you know, the, the Obamacare is an issue and the $17 trillion debt. But you know what I think, Tony, goes even before all this? They're just disgusted. Absolutely disgusted. And it's Republicans and Democrats. And they look at them and they feel like they're kids in a sandbox out in Washington, D.C. playing. And, and some people have absolutely given up hope. They just say... It's not possible, and and you know I'm I'm obviously an underdog in this race in the sense I'm I'm not from from the metro. I'm actually it's it's rare to have a candidate from Greater Minnesota. I'm I'm also not a millionaire. You know they say in in politics you should be tall, dark, handsome, and a millionaire. Well, look at me, <laughs> folks that are watching this show. I'm none of those. But what I am is a hard worker, and I'm going to prove that actually uh, I think the American dream is still alive. And the same thing with how our representatives are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, you know, what are people saying about the performance of Senator Al Franken so far? I mean, it, obviously he's got name recognition. He was yeah. a comedian and uh, worked for Senator Night Live and whatnot. Uh, are people satisfied with the job that Senator Franken is doing right now in the Senate? Well, you know, I, I think sometimes, you know, kind of the mainstream media says, well, he's, he's popular. He's, he's got a 50% approval or what it is. But, you know, you have to think about this. We are Minnesota nice. And so, uh, but I think there's a distinction between Minnesota nice and Minnesota naive. And I think when the poll comes, it's going to be a different story. But right now, I think people are saying, you know, he's a nice guy. Uh, he, he's, he's okay. But when it comes down to what has he done in six years, I think that's a little bit more problematic for him. He's got a record he has to defend. And I think people are just kind of shaking their head when I go out in the area and they're saying, wow, um, what's he been doing? Mm -hmm. and, and so I think he's going to have a tough time in, uh, for re-election. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was elected in the contentious, uh, what, what was 2008 election against right. uh, Senator Norm Coleman. Didn't even get a, a majority of the vote. And, uh, you know, that was, that was an issue not in and of itself. And right. then when he went to the U.S. Senate, one of his uh, most defining votes was he was the 60th vote uh, for the exactly. Affordable Care, Care Act, for the so-called Obamacare Act. Yeah. And many people say, well, if, if Senator Coleman would have won that race, uh, we wouldn't be facing the, the disasters that many Minnesotans are facing and across this country with Obamacare. So it's a big issue. Some people are saying it's going to be the issue in 2014. I, 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 I'm not quite sure about that. I think it remains to be seen. And Well, I... I think it has to be, uh, you know, the major issue. And here's why, Tony. I mean, I, I'm talking about the $17 trillion debt. But the $17 trillion debt's just going to be an anthill compared to what the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare is going to put on our society. Already we know it's one-sixth of the economy. I would argue that this is the largest 
middle class tax increase that we've had in a long time. I mean, I was talking to a guy when I was out uh, in Moorhead campaigning, and, and what he does is he, he works construction. He comes in and he works as a waiter in the, uh, in the off season. And he says, Chris, I'm going to have about a $15,000 increase in my premiums. So can you imagine what's going on? And we've already heard that people are going to be losing their jobs because of this. And, and, and Senator Franken has to answer to this. And, and, you know, there's one thing that we have to ask him about this is either he read the bill or he didn't read it. And if he read the bill knowing he passed it, that it actually imposed on Minnesota that health care medical device, which was devastating to our economy. So now he's running around the state saying, you know, we need manufacturing job. Well, a, a doctor would tell you the first priority of a doctor is do no harm. Well, that should be for a U.S. Senator also for the state of Minnesota. Do no harm to the state of Minnesota. Yet, you know, what happens is this is a federal government solution that came out of Washington, D.C. health care imposed on Minnesota. And, and who really is driving the bus in Washington, D.C.? It's the larger states, California and New York. Now, you know, I know Senator Franken's probably spent a, a majority of his life for a long time in New York. So maybe he feels comfortable with, you know, uh, you know, New York and legislators deciding for Minnesota. But I think most Minnesotans say, you know what, Minnesotans can better define our own health care. Well, let me tell you this story, yeah. Chris, uh, in regards to health care, because this, this Affordable Care Act is an enormous law that many people still are finding out what's in it, as uh, Nancy Pelosi famously yeah. said. Are there some good things in it? And I want to first sure. give this example because in uh, 2012, I remember during uh, the campaign, uh, there was a candidate who was talking to a young gal, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to say who it was, but the young gal asked, you know, are you trying to uh, take away the provision for uh, pre-existing conditions? She explained how she had leukemia mm -hmm. and how uh, this change in the health care was actually going to help her to find insurance. And I watched this candidate uh, tell this young girl point blank that they believe in free market economics and you could just see the girl's face mm -hmm. <laughs> drop. And granted, she's not a voter, but uh, the point being here is that, you know, health care is a little bit different, I think, anyways, than your uh, any type of other widget or in the free market. It actually has to do with people's dignity and, and their liberty and, and mm -hmm. things of that sort. So specifically in regards to the pre-existing conditions do you think that that's a good idea to to basically require insurance companies to cover everybody yeah i do i think i think there's a couple issues that most minnesotans wouldn't wouldn't disagree with first of all pre-existing conditions you have to do something about it the other idea is you know people are getting their their lives their their savings wiped out because of devastating health care costs uh, the other issue that's uh, you know I don't know how, how well it's being addressed is the issue of mental health or mental illness and I'm as a county it's commissioner, a huge issue it's a huge issue and so here's where we're at I don't think anybody in Minnesota is disagreeing that these are issues that we need to address so here's the next question then how do you address them best mm -hmm. is it a Minnesota solution Mm -hmm. Because what you want is you want affordable, you want efficient, effective health care. You mm -hmm. want also effective, responsive health care. You want to be able to work with your doctor, not have a government being involved if, as much as possible. So where are you going to get the best solution? Driven by Minnesotans or a solution out of Washington, D.C. imposed by basically, as I was saying earlier, mm -hmm. the large states driving the bus saying, hey, it's a one-size-fits-all. This is how it's going to work for Minnesota, and I don't believe that works. And so my argument is, first of all, the federal government overstepped, and they overstepped in many instances, Tony. One of the things is education. I mean, we have what's called Common Core. Why should the federal government be telling Minnesotans, this is what kind of curriculum you have to teach in your state? We should make that determination. And that what I'd argue is all the 50 states should decide, how do we make ourselves competitive for the 21st century? But we can make this. What, you know, they, it's kind of like Al Franken and his bunch feels that when you get to Washington, D.C., they, they put on, the, it's almost like get smart. They put these helmets on and they get this brain uh, extra energy out there that we don't have in Minnesota. And they get smarter out there. <laughs> well, I don't think that's the case. And so they're involved in everything. They're involved in health care to tell us what to do. They're involved in education. They're involved even in child support. And what I would argue is in Minnesota, we can make the best decisions. Mm -hmm. And the other phenomena that we've seen from the tragic uh, gun violence situations that have occurred in Colorado and Florida and other places is you're actually seeing the federal government start to move or at least attempt to restrict people's gun rights, mm -hmm. which runs almost counter to the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. 
And so I, can you just talk a little more about Senator Franken's uh, record on gun control? And if he had it his way, what would be enacted in, in the state and the country? Well, you know, the, the kind of the question, too, tongue-in-cheek is are we talking about where he'd like to be today or where he's been in the past? Because I think the NRA in the past at, at one point put him at an F rating. And so they've said it's absolutely abysmal. And, and so that's where I'm a, a clear-cut difference is I'm supportive of the Second Amendment. But, you know, we talked earlier, you know, really what the issue is, the, the big thing that's going on mm -hmm. is mental health. There's a mental health issue mm -hmm. with some of these shootings. And so... What one faction's tried to do is they've tried to take advantage of the fact of a mental health problem, and they've tried to take and, and chip away at two of our most fundamental rights, the First Amendment and the Second Amendment. And I would argue against Senator Franken in any attempt to infringe on either the First or Second Amendment. And what I mean by that is, of course, you know, your listeners know the First Amendment talks about any kind of infringement on the press. And right now, you know, it's just a matter of time that they're going to start to go for that, too. And they're going to say, oh, we'd never do that but it's putting the camel's head under that. And pretty soon they're going to say, you know what, TV stations, radio <coughs> stations, print stations, we don't want you publicizing these type of stories because we know that people with mental illness sometimes will use different type of devices to gain attention. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to censor you in how you do your media or publication. That's wrong. There shouldn't be a First Amendment infringement because of another problem of working on the issue of mental health. Same with the Second Amendment. We don't go and it's the, the camel's head under the tent. You don't take away fundamental rights that have been in this country you know, since the beginning because of this problem. So let's address the problem. But you have people that they have their own agenda. And their own agenda, and again, it gets out of, like I say, Washington, D.C. They think they're smarter than everybody. It's like, this is how we'd like you to handle your Second Amendment rights or your First Amendment rights. And says, well, we're comfortable a little bit with rights, but we'll determine what your rights are. You're not going to determine it. And they're using devices, and one of them is they're, they're, they're pegging onto the mental health <coughs> or the mental illness issue as one means to take a foothold in there and chip away at the rights. Mm -hmm. it did you always want to run for the U.S. Senate? Is this something you've been thinking about for decades? Oh, or no. Or when you were a kid, you <laughs> wanted to be a, a politician? Or? No, I mean, you know, I, when I was a kid, I was interested in getting involved in government. And I probably, uh, you, you know, I got involved when I was 16 in civics. And you start to think, boy, well, you know, what's the possibilities of running, you know, running for higher office? But somewhere down the road, uh, you know, your life takes over. And like uh, for me, I ran for the city council when I was 28. And then I got out of government for 13 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know that I'd ever be back in. And so uh, I decided to run for the uh, county board. And what I've said on the county board now, I just got reelected with 60%. And it's my second term. So in county county boards, it's four years, so it's eight years. Mm -hmm. So you won, you won 60% of the 60% vote? 60% in in at an election year when Obama got 70%. Wow. And in blue-collar district. And I think that's going to be the heart of this U.S. Senate race. Is so that you had a lot of people that were voting for President Obama and also voting for Chris Exactly. Dalbert. And it was clear on the county board that a lot of times I was a six to one vote. I was out there all on my own saying, you know what? I can't go with this spending. This is wrong. This is irresponsible. And so that message up there. So already I've got a built in base and mm -hmm. that's their stronghold mm -hmm. is, you know, Senator Franken is, is, is banking on that. But where I go against him is we're strong on Second Amendments up in northeastern Minnesota. That's a huge issue. Other issue is pro-life is a big issue. I'm strong on pro-life, one man, one woman. And these are issues that are very strong to the, the average and they're, they're Reagan Democrats, as we talk about. So I think he's going to have a problem there. So we're going to move the needle in northeastern Minnesota, and we're going to work across the entire area. And it gets back to the thing I was saying earlier, Tony. You can't win this race as either a Republican or a Democrat if you only get your party in there. Because that doesn't, you don't get to the 50%. So you have to get the independence. And I want to also get those that I call the open-minded, you know, uh, Democrats, or would be the uh, the middle uh, middle of the road or, or, or conservative Democrats. And so, you know, the extremes on either party, maybe you can't attract them. Maybe the Democrat can't attract the extreme on the right, and the and the right can't attract on the left. But I think you can get the the middle base there, and that's what's needed. Mm -hmm. It, you know, I was at uh, in my office earlier this week and sure. uh, having a, a political discussion with a coworker yeah. who who's a, a rock solid DFLer, okay. and, and him and I were discussing some of the issues, and um, you know, the issues of of unions came up, and uh, you know, he 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 was surprised when I explained to him that I, I support uh, the right for labor to organize in the private yeah. sector, and I realize 
uh, the importance uh, of that in terms of balancing powers and making sure that middle class interests are being represented. And, and he was surprised because he, he thought all Republicans were against unions. And my question for you is, are, are you against unions? Oh, absolutely not. I got uh, way back when I ran in 1991 for the uh, Duluth City Council, I was working as a factory worker. I sat on a box. I caught hardboard off of the uh, saw at Superwood. And the United Paper Workers International endorsed me. I was a member of their union. And most recently, I got endorsed by both the Teamsters in 2012 and also the Building and Trades. And the reason why the Building and Trades guys endorsed me is because they want to get mining going up on the mm -hmm. range. And you've got a fraction, uh, uh, you know, there's a, a divide going on right now between the government employees, the AFSME, and the Building and Trades guys. And what's going on is the, the government employees, they're, they're kind of happy. They know they got their lot. There's a built-in business there that's going to continue on and and they just are they're concerned sort of about their benefits they've got sort of a vision of what they would like they're in sometimes some more social issues whereas the building and trades guys say listen we want jobs you know up there it's we want jobs in northeastern minnesota we want to go to work uh you know leave us alone on a lot of these social issues that you're trying to you know <coughs> uh, micromanage on and so that's how i got that endorsement and and i think that it's open you talk though am i for it i'm actually you know absolutely for unions and the other thing is I do business law, and, and one of the things you talk about is transactional costs. So there's a benefit if you've got a union that you're negotiating with, and there's 2,000 or 3,000 people in there to deal with that with the union, if you can, leaders, then how do you deal with 3,000 employees? Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, and so uh, there's not good and bad managers, not good and bad management and bad, you know, unions. I think you, they work together. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you talk about what you have coming up with your campaign until sure. the rest of the year and then moving sure. forward to the spring? Sure. Well, check uh, DahlbergNow.com. Uh, That's the website. I, I, I know that I always have to talk more about it. So www.dahlbergnow.com. But we're going to be going uh, a lot of door knocking. Uh, we're going out to meet and greets. I've gone, to, uh, you know, I, when whoever invites me, I go to these events. So they have what's called BPO use. And for the listeners, that's basic political organizational units. So I go to Republican basic political organization units. That generally is a Senate district or county. They invite me. I speak. I enjoy it. Uh, there's other organizations such as the Tea Party that have invited me to different events in the community. And I go to them. I go out to the one out in uh, East Central, uh, the Central Tea Party. I've been up to one in, uh, recently in St. Cloud. And then I do meet and greets on my own. And so I'm going to be coming down here in another two weeks and going through the metro. So it's, it's exciting. I like to go out and, and meet the people. And then, of course, you know, there's always you got to raise money, too. Our campaign's got some fundraisers coming up. We're having an official headquarters opening on my birthday on December 6th up in Duluth. And we're going to do uh, probably some tacos or something like that. So Nice. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a good idea if you yeah. need some help making okay. those tacos. Okay. Uh, we'll do. Yeah. And how important is, is the money aspect? Do you, do you have an estimate? Because uh, I know uh, Governor Ventura, Jesse Ventura, like him or hate him, he, he made history because yep. he won the governor's seat as an independent yep. on $300,000 <laughs> budget. So it, yeah. these types of things are, are possible because people always talk about the multi-millions of dollars that you need. How much is the Dahlberg for U.S. Senate campaign going to need, do you think? Well, you know, well, first of all, I, I would say, Tony, that no one's going to match Al Frank. And I understand. I think he can have fundraisers with Conan O'Brien or anyone, you know. So he's going to be funded by the East big, Coast, big, West big Coast, liberals. Hollywood, Broadway. I don't have that. But Which I have means that the people here aren't going to be represented. That well, money is going to be represented. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a concern. And so what I'm going to go is the average Minnesotans that I'm going to get the concern on. But you talk about it, it's going to be obviously millions of dollars. But I think the other thing, Tony, is I believe the underdog can still win in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. we're, we're very independent people. Mm -hmm. And we will look at the person, and this is where we'll cross the party lines. And we've done it many times. And people will say, you know what, this guy is a common sense person. I like what he says. I like the front porch leadership, the idea that we need to return Washington, D.C. back to Minnesota, and that's the most effective government. Because, you know, why I talk about front porch leadership is another thing about local government. Because, you know, some people said, well, wow, you're running from a county commissioner all the way up to U.S. Senate. Well, and a lot of times it's the step from U.S. Congress to, U to, to U.S. Senate, and maybe that's the problem. They're already in Washington, D.C., and they're staying there. It would be nice if we had people that are in local government to go out to Washington to say, hey, I want to bring government back to the people in Minnesota. But going to that local government issue, Tony, one of the things I always say is that if a local elected official makes what I call, quote, a bonehead decision, they get thrown out of office. 
But in Washington, D.C., the re-election rate's 95%. Mm -hmm. And we know they're not doing that great a job. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's where, you know, if you're going to hit the $17 trillion debt and really start to solve some of the problems, you got to return the issues back to Minnesota and the other states. Mm -hmm. And in and, and talking about that, I did want to talk one more thing if I can. Sure. You know, I'm from northeastern Minnesota, and obviously I have to work with Democrats up there as a conservative. That's going to be needed in the U.S. Senate. Because if, if I'm elected to the U.S. Senate, it would be nice to have one Republican, one Democrat from Minnesota in there so we can have both sides of the aisles. But I'm going to work on the Democratic side because this message I talk about state rights, there's a lot of other smaller states that are saying, you know what, I don't know if it's a good deal to have New York or, or California driving the bus on this. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Yeah. There's even, you can even see it in, in local regions yes. inside of states that yep. are having that same uh, issue yes. with what they believe is lack of representation and, and over-representation of, of urban core elitism. Right, right, yeah. So, well, Chris Dahlberg, I certainly appreciate you Thank taking you. the time to come here and uh, be on the show. And uh, it's great to meet your daughter, Maya. She's yeah. a beautiful gal. And you guys are heading to the Mall of America after We're, this. Yeah, to do a yeah, she, fun yeah last night we had a little fun time up in Duluth. We did the Christmas City of the North Parade. And uh, a little chilly up there, 14 degrees, but we're going to the Mall of America. And, you know, when I was running for... Uh, the U.S. Senate, I told my daughter, I said, listen, I, I, I got some bad news. I'm going to have to take you to all these county fairs across the state. We're going to have to go on all of these <laughs> rides. We're going to have to check the animal barns and everything. And so she likes that idea. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And, you know, that's a lot of where my strength is. I've, I've been coming down to the Metro, and I come down here every week, and I'm down here for two days. But also, of course, I'm from greater Minnesota, and I'm going to be continuing to go out in that area too. And I think that's important. People expect that. Well, thank you so much, thank Chris you, Dahlberg, Tony. for coming really on the show, the Commissioner. The opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Hope yeah. to have you again soon. We'll do. So that is uh, St. Louis County Commissioner Chris Dahlberg on the show. We appreciate him coming on. He's running for the United States Senate. He wants to earn the Republican endorsement to run against Senator Al Franken. And he had a lot of great things to say about his candidacy and his appeal to uh, people in the middle, the independents, uh, which is going to be absolutely crucial in order to defeat Franken in 2014. So uh, his website is dahlbergnow.com, dahlbergnow.com. I encourage everybody to go on there, uh, check him out, learn more about the issues, and, and feel free to, to help him out or contact him or if you had any other questions or anything like that. So.